welcome back. You're still watching What Are You Saying? Hashtag ways. Now, when we hear female genital mutilation, what comes to mind? Some, pro um, some procedure done on girls, right? Um, this is not just a pr procedure. It is procedure that involves altering or injuring the female genitalia or the non-medical reasons, mainly to keep young females from being promiscuous. Now, today we're asking, why is this practice still on? And our guest, Raymond Okwani, is the founder of Youth Spark Pan Africa. He's a graduate of Guardian Media Global Campaign of the End Female Genital Mutilation UK and also a social media advocate on the UNICEF and Cutting Girls campaign. Remember, you can join the conversation. Twitter us at Plus TV Africa or at Show Africa one with the hashtag Waze, or you send us an SMS or a WhatsApp message on 081-8038-4663. Thanks for joining us, Raymond. Thank you so much. It's good to be here. <laughs> now, I was reading, you know, something about <laughs> female genital mutilation. <laughs> and trust me, I was just flabbergasted. Traumatized. Yeah, because traumatized. you didn't believe it's still happening, right? <laughs> yeah, because At the level. Okay, so let me give a background. Okay. Right? I am from Edo State. Okay. And I was circumcised. I have seven sisters. We are sorry, we're seven girls and two boys. And all of us were circumcised. Okay. And I I mean, when I'm reading female genital mutilation, because when people talk about it, I don't feel like it's any big deal. Mm. Because for, for us it is like the way you have a male child and before the child is age i mean 10, 10 days old you'd have done the circumcision that's how we were circumcised as babies so it's just to you know and of course the myth around promiscuity and all of that were part of the reasons so when i when i read the research done by by the world health organization about the various types of female genital mutilation i was like okay does this exist? Is this is this true? So maybe you would help me break it down. What is female genital mutilation, and what exactly um, is this campaign about? Okay, thank you so much again. It's good to be here. Um, uh, I, I'm not surprised that you are surprised that maybe it's now a big. It's looking like a big deal now, because that's exactly what it's supposed to be, because it's 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 dependent on culture, right? Actually, female genital mutilation is, a, is the total or partial removal of the female external genitalia for non-medical reasons. Mm -hmm. Because and there can be issues where a certified, professional, qualified medical uh, professional can say, yeah. I mean, for some obvious reasons, this has to go, right? But for non-medical reasons, the altering of the female external genitalia is what is referred to as female genital mutilation. And let me also put this, um, over the years, we've also had a lot of people um, address it, at the, uh, call several names. You find people call female circumcision, you find people call female genital cutting, and you find people call female genital mutilation. Now, female, I, from, from the studies we have done and knowledge we've acquired, there is nothing like female circumcision. The circumcision we have is male circumcision. Because for the female, mutilation is about going to something that was originally placed there and altering it. And let me also point out that female genital mutilation has four types. You have the first type, type one, mm -hmm. which is actually, we call it a clitoridectomy, which is actually the removal of the clitoris only. And then we have the type two, which is the removal of the clitoris and some part of the inner layer. That's called the, the excision. Yeah, that's the excision, female external genitalia. And then we have the type three, which is actually the most, uh, uh, it's, it's, that one is actually crazy because they have, to, it, they have to remove everything, the clitoris, inner layer. So what will now remain is and, and remove the uh, labia minora and the labia majora and then, and also stitch it back leaving a tiny hole for urinary uh, menstrual flow and urine. And then we have the type four, which we call unclassified, which in, it doesn't involve cutting, but it involves um, um, piercing or rubbing or massaging of the clitoris uh, with corrosive substances, so bam. Uh, yeah, so that it loses sensitivity. Uh, that's basically what they, they do. So they do it to deaden the cells so that it's it's there but it's not there so, so before you people come in 
Wow. This infibulation. Infibulation. Yes, please. And the other category. Yes. Where is it practiced? So, um, according to culture, because people also have different reasons why they practice female genital mutilation, that's also how you find different set of places where people um, engage in a specific type of the practice. So you find some places where maybe it, it's not so pronounced. So for instance, the type three, uh, it's not so uh, found in Nigeria, but then some part of Nigeria also do it. Like I've worked in a community in a boy where a woman told her story, you know, and, and actually came out openly to say she was caught and she, it was a type 3. In fact, she didn't even know the type, because amazingly, a lot of people don't even know that there are types. Oh my God. You know, they just know that uh, this has to be done, and they just give themselves to be done. So the lady told us a story that, as we are looking at her, she would have been a dead person, and I mean, she has a practical lessons on her two daughters. So she underwent the type 3, and the, the, of course, they don't did the stitching, and then they were, when they were waiting for um, during the healing process was when her daughter, she gave birth. Now, now let me also point out that some of the challenges with the type 3 is that when they remove all those layers and stitch it back, automatically what happens is that when the person gets healed, it forms scars and keloids. So when the woman is about to give birth, automatically there, is no, there is no elasticity. Right. So that natural, natural expansion again. that exactly. is supposed to happen it's difficult. for the baby to come out. Exactly. So you find people having long obstructed level because the, the there is no elasticity of the vaginal so opening. So they have to um, um, cut, it again. cut it open. So the baby again. comes out. They also have to put it back. So the lady, the no. woman, have to undergo a lot of pain. So that was actually ha what happened to the woman. And during those eight days, of course, her baby is already out. Eight days was still during her own healing process. Now, some communities, um, part of their healing procedure is that they put up hot water in a bucket and get a woman to either sit on it yeah. with some leaves on yeah. it and all that. Yeah. So during her own, her own healing process, uh, her baby is already out. She has already been caught on the eighth day. And one of those days, she was undergoing that uh, something like that and her stitch tore. Right, so, and she almost bled to death. I mean, her, it's, it's, I mean, her, her, she bled, almost bled to death. And when she eventually recovered, when she eventually recovered, she made up her mind that she was not going to, you know, cut any other person or her, any other, her child again. Eventually, she gave birth to her second daughter and refused to cut her second daughter. She was not giving us an instance and said, she, out of those, her two daughters, they are both married and have kids but that she experienced a lot of challenges with her first daughter. That as for her second daughter, she never got to have to worry anything about her. So it's actually dependent on people's culture. You have countries, there are over 28 to 29 countries where it's been practiced, Kenya, Somalia, the Gambia, um, and a lot of other countries in Egypt, and even some countries in Western, in, in, in the West, where they also practice, don't do the practice. Oh, yeah. Sorry, sorry, I have to cut you. Here. Yes, please. Why is it a predominantly third world thing? Why is it that the Western world don't practice it? Why? How did it emerge? Okay, so world? again, FGM has been a long term um, practice um, where, as it is, you see a lot of people coming up with their own version of tracing it back to origin. Some people have traced it back to the times of Pharaoh where he had a lot of wives and wanted to curb them from meeting men. He didn't want other men to touch their wives. He has to not tame them, right, by doing, engaging in those acts and all that. That's the fire I know that a lot of people have traced it back to. But um, it's not a third world thing. Just like I told you, it's been happening in the West. Uh, it happens in some part of the West. But you know one thing with if, um, evolution, when things are evolving, yeah. people are moving ahead and find, discovering new things. But again, you discover that um, us that are in this part of the world, when we get involved in a particular thing, I mean, we are stuck in it. It's difficult to change our minds to say this is not happening. Uh, I mean, there is nothing you can do to change anybody's mind in their community, especially where you have to respect people for age, hmm. religion, and a lot of things that we believe that makes it very difficult for you to even bring new thing okay. to things that has always so, been happening. So given that this is, uh, this is happening, yeah. first of all, and 
it's clearly a global issue because it's it's big enough to be addressed by one of the um, strategic development goals. So I would like to know what the statistics are. What kind of numbers are we looking at here? Um, maybe globally or even within Nigeria? What, what, what is the real? OK, so according to statistics, um, um, uh, currently there are over, over 200 million women you know, yeah. have undergone the practice of female genital mutilation. And uh, currently, the United Nations, the World Health Organization, is saying that about at least 4.1 million women stand the risk, the risk of being, yeah. you know, mutilated mm -hmm. annually uh, in, uh, at the global sphere. Now, um, it's 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 a, it's a very big number, but a lot of work has been is being done, you know, at the background. And I'm going to talk about that much probably much later in the conversation. What things that have been done in at the, at the background. Uh, then coming back here in Nigeria, in Nigeria, I've been privileged to work with some, uh, be in in, in some um, in some groups and platforms where the young people are, you know, coming together to amplify their voice against changing some social social norms and all that. Uh, currently, we're working in five states, which, according to statistics, again, are actually the five top prevalent uh, in states. Can, you, can in we name the states? We need yeah. to know yeah, the so states. So we we'll have Oyo State, we we'll have a boy ranking second, we we'll have Imo, we we'll have Ekiti, we we'll have Oshun, uh, we we'll have. We have Oshun State yet. Oyo, Eboy, Ekiti, Imo, and Oshun so State. So you mean Oyo tops? Yes, Oyo top first. In fact, Oyo was actually the uh, I'm first. I'm shock. Okay, Oyo was actually the first state that um, yes that did the first public uh, declaration of FGMC abandonment mm -hmm. with the a team that got us the Guardian Media Global Campaign UK who went there. And then all the circumcisers, people who call circumcisers who perform the practice, had to come out and publicly declare. But for it to happen, a lot of work was done behind. You need to mm -hmm. come up and tell that professor that all the years they spent, all the 30 years, all the 40 years they've invested studying a particular course, that was actually not helpful, right? Mm -hmm. It takes a lot, it takes a lot of advocacy, it took a lot of advocacy, a lot of engagement, a lot of sensitization that cut across different um, stakeholders. You talk about the traditional rulers, the, the, the religious rulers, you talk about the legislators, the security agencies, you talk about even the circumcisers themselves, young yeah. people, women, our grandmothers. So nobody was actually so, you know what? Um, we'll take a break now. We'll still keep you here because um, this there's is really, yeah, about. there's a lot to talk about because I was reading somewhere and um, it also shows that some parts in the Middle East in Asia also practice this then also they, there was something interesting i found out that immigrants mm -hmm. that go to the western countries they're introducing, you understand? they're introducing it so i want to know if there are laws against you know this female genital mutilation or it's just campaigns and if there are strong laws that you know you it's go to jail yeah. if it's if it has been criminalized, criminalized yeah so we'll go on a quick break when we return we'll still have our guests with us please stay with us